Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, it's uh, nearly summer here in South Africa right now, getting warmer, so no jacket today. So, yep, amazing to be back in this uh, Wednesday afternoon session. This is now today our 11th uh, educational webinar session. As you can see on the screen, um, yeah, we've been busy with it um, for quite a while. So my name is Wilhelm Swart. I lead the OD cluster um, at Foresight. And yeah, so today we're going to see much more interesting things. If we quickly go back to you know what we've seen already. So you can see like we had it more than two months ago right now already. We started with advanced process control and you know great insight from Kevin on you know how do you use that to to optimize plants and bring value. Then we went into the asset performance management space with the teams from Aspen Tech and also from Blue you know, and, and and figured out how can I pred predict failures long in advance and you know what would I do with that information. We we had various sessions on MES in the cloud and you know and and also higher level of MES sessions. You can see some of the MES um, sessions here. Uh, we, so, so many of these themes we've basically came and we went more deeply into. Um, for example, looked at the latest, greatest technology in advanced process control here on the 17th. So all these events are recorded. You can always refer back to them and go and look at those recordings. Um, we, you know, here on the 24th of July, uh, June, we focused on um, a multivariate analysis on looking like if you do have reproduction quality issue, how would you solve it? How would you find that needle in the haystack? How would you come about and to try and resolve that? You know, and uh, if you have a, you know, how would I see, listen, uh, if I continue on this, on this pattern, what will be the quality of my production or the yield of my production after 24 hours? You know, and so those are the type of scenarios. Run about in the beginning of July, we looked at automation as well, and you know some scenarios there, and so on. You know, um, and, and and today, so very exciting. When, when, before we 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 build plants, and sometimes also when we've built plants, we really want to you know do a constraint simulation on seeing. Listen, wh how what are we doing against you know what is possible, you know, and 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 the capacity, and, and much more on that later. So if we look at, for example, and so just a, a quick one, I, I just brought this one in here. Is, is as a group, you know, we've been at it now for for um, 11 weeks and we will bring more, you know, so, so we, we're planning this big event in September uh, as part of the Foresight group. And, you know, this will be a virtual event and you will be able to interact, you know, live uh, in these presentations and also visit us at exhibition stands. And yeah, so we're seeing for seeing a whole full day event where you would be able to look at these simulation or these MES um, or these um, latest and greatest versions that's coming out in the software, interact with our teams, talk to them, you know, and really um, have a great experience, but more about that later. You know, and then, so if you look at, you know, Foresight Operational Technology Group, really we give uh, quite a comprehensive solution set to the client. So really, you know, we would get involved in control systems, instrumentation systems, you know, energy management, um, MCCs, you know, so to do with the control and the automation of plants. And then, you know, once you do that, you start pushing the data into historians. So we'll do, you know, uh, MAS or manufacturing, operational manufacturing systems on top of that to bring value to that. And like higher orders, order systems like metal accounting or delay accounting, downtime systems, you know, I've mentioned before, as the performance management, look at the maintenance type of technologies as well. So from a, a, a OT group, uh, you can see we do quite a lot. But a lot of the time before you do things, you have to simulate. And also when you're in operation, you must always simulate against constraints and see how do you go about. And, and that's really the theme of today. Like, not, you know, you could, it could be a warehouse, it could be logistics, it could be a rail system, it could be a, like a process um, plant as we're going to focus on today um, and you know quite important so but I think this slide is just to show all these type of solutions so very interesting all right you say well you know that's what you do but what's the benefit and so what we're trying to show on this slide is what's the key benefits that we're driving you know through all these technologies and solutions that we provide as an OT cluster and so really the key themes is like you know how do we bring safety to the workforce you know and there's various solutions associated with that from APM and automation, whatever. How do we run your operations, your plant, your logistics facility, your mine greener? You know, how do we save carbon? How do we save, you know, uh, megawatts in power usage? Every time I save a megawatt, I save a ton of CO2 gas. How do I run the operations faster? Very much in, you know, in, in you know, from a simulation point of view, where then we drive 
that we get the OEE of the plant better again. And, you know, what's the value of that? So Yaku and them will tell us about, you know, uh, um, how much we can potentially gain in, in dollar value, in rand value on a specific facility, you know, and then we use other technologies to drive that, you know, implementing, for example, yield improvement, or, you know, and, and various things. Like if, you, if your quality of production is weak, then again, you use, you're losing quite a lot of, of value or, or, or production value. You know, and so, so these are the type of benefits that we're driving. If we bring asset performance management in, you know, then we can start predicting a failure um, or do condition monitoring to see, listen, when it's going to fail. If we do have a failure because we're well prepared, we've had a warning some time before, then our duration of the failure is much less. You know, and, and also, you know, all working towards reduction in, in, in maintenance costs. And, and, you know, and in all these systems, you know, as a group, we all do training to the clients as well. So we really, we try and enable the client to be self-sufficient, you know, and so, and also, you know, work um, with, with, with methodologies to be able to be able to, to, to develop, to deliver quite fast solution engineering to them. So maybe as a last view from me before I hand over to the set team, just a quick overview of what we do. So at Foresight Operational Technologies, really what we believe is, is you know, we use data and you know, the latest, greatest technologies uh, to provide solutions to our customers, our people, our clients, you know, and, and really in new business models. You know, so, so and again, that's where it, it becomes quite um, 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 important because, you know, through the, the art of simulation and building a digital twin, we can actually say, oh, you know, you can actually, in this spe specific facility, double the throughput, you know, uh, can you imagine that? Let's run a few scenarios and see, you know, and then if, 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 if we prove that, then we go and find other technologies to implement it. The type of technologies that we often use in here is things like, you know, advanced analytics on data or multivariate analysis or machine learning, AI, deep learning on data to predict, you know, look at a pattern, predict something that's going to happen. VR, AR, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, things like simulation. So really the key focus of the day and also planning and scheduling type systems to really uh, uh, improve that uh, throughout the whole. So, so all these technologies that's really, in the, you know, shown here in the middle is brought to our customers through three companies or three entities in foresight operational technology. The first one is H, um, H Technologies, which is an, an asset automation focused company, and they focus on, you know, deploying instrumentation on industrial facilities, um, connecting to that, to, uh, connected to PLC, SCADAs, DCS systems, uh, bringing control to that uh, specific environment, bringing safety to that environment, and then it will deploy, you know, a SCADA or, you know, uh, um, or an HMI on top of that to help with visualization. They also get involved in like, you know, more, you know, latest 5G type connectivity or edge-based connectivity and also cyber security in an industrial um, space. So doing an audit in your industrial network, see where the vulnerabilities are and how we can fill that. You know, and so, so really they are a multi-vendor um, um, system integrator. Uh, for Siemens, Schneider, Rockwell, ABB, you know, and they can provide those type of solutions to you. So great team of guys ready to help you and part of the Foresight Operational Technologies Group. Next one up is Blue SP, the one that I lead and very much um, so, so an Aspentec uh, reseller and an ISP. We see ourselves as a very <clears throat> agile solutions company with chemical engineers, industrial uh, uh, um, 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 automation engineers, data engineers, uh, um, and, and providing solutions. And really what we do is we transform data. So we take the data that we gather, gather from, uh, from uh, um, these industrial facilities and we start you know, transforming that data. So, so turn data into information with machine learning and AI, bring more knowledge and wisdom to that data and then link it through to the ERP system, be it a Sage or an Acromatica or a, or a, a, a Microsoft or, or a SAP system or whatever, link it through so that whatever's in your ERP is always in sync with the bottom systems. And then the third group, and you know, for today, one of the most important groups is, um, you know, simulation engineering technologies, a bunch of, um, about 26 industrial engineers in Johannesburg also focus very much on, you know, on constraint simulation um, in, in a, 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 a process, you know, and also in a warehouse facility. They also do planning and scheduling uh, simulation for, uh, solutions, you know, and, and also the control of that. So, but let, let the team talk very much about 
what they do and how they start, you know, sometimes on a brown fields, on a green fields, but also how do they sometimes simulate in a brown fields and create these digital twins to bring huge value to the client. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Marco to tell us a little bit about himself and also just to present, the pre to, to introduce the presenters of the day. Marco, over to you. Great, thanks you very much, uh, Wilhelm, and uh, thanks everyone. Much. Thanks everyone for having me here. Um, so yes, uh, from myself, I, my name is Marco, and I'm just going to be the host of this SET um, webinar. Today we'll be focusing on our digital twin technology, and we can't do it without the help of Jaco Berta as well as Willem. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jaco and Willem, for having us. Uh, so from my side, Welcome. I just like to say that um, we're just going to be talking a bit about now about the um, digital twin technology and how it's slowly been growing in popularity over the last few years. Uh, we talk a lot about it, um, digital twin, and what actually is it? How does it differ from, say, the fourth industrial revolution? And we're going to just um, talk a bit about that within this um, within this webinar. We're going to be focusing a lot on, on what actually is digital twin technology and its benefits. But then we're also going to be focusing on a case study that actually looks at how um, using a digital twin within a large project was actually extremely beneficial for them. And then lastly, we're going to be focusing on some questions and answers. So if anyone does have any questions throughout the webinar, there are more than um, you're more than welcome to um, place it in the chat and then we'll get through to them at later on in this stage. So just a first up introduction will be a little introduction about SET and our company background. Uh, over to you, uh, Yaku. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, yes, I want to personally welcome everyone from taking time out of your busy, busy schedules to attend this uh, webinar. I think you'll find it um, quite useful. I hope so. Um, just briefly on ACT, um, we were established in 2004, so we're in, in our 16th year now. Um, and recently in 2018, formed part of the Foresight Group. As um, Valhalla mentioned, we are basically a team of industrial engineers. Uh, we've got an office in Centurion and one in Cape Town as well. Uh, we're the largest simulation, specialized simulation company in South Africa. Uh, not very big, but, um, you know, it's quite a niche market. Um, but that, I think, leverages us to really push the, tech, the envelope of the technology. Um, and if we look at this slide here, uh, it's just sort of focusing more recently on the number of worldwide projects that we performed in the processing plant industry, which is which is really the focus of today. Um, as I mentioned, we specialize in computer simulation studies, mainly in the mining industry, um, but we also have premier senior partner that performs um, customized training um, all over the world in utilizing the software. Um, we also play a bit in the ports and rail and also in the warehouse technologies, as Valhalla mentioned. So in a nutshell, that's that's ACT. I don't want to talk too much about us and get to the, the main part of the presentation. So with that, I'll, I'm going to hand over back to, to Marco. OK, sorry, let me cover this, this one as well. Um, if we look at our main clients, um, it's really the companies you'll see there, you'll recognize as mainly South African Mining companies, um, Anglo-American is one of our largest clients, as well as Exaro, um, and also the the Beers Group, um, the Swana. So we've built processing plant simulations for all of these companies, most of the South African operations, um, and I think we've been quite successful in saving our clients lots of money um, in capital avoidance, mainly, which is some of the things we're going to touch on today. Over on the right there, you can see we cover all the different commodities, all the way from copper, diamonds, gold. Um, so um, a lot of the operations um, internationally have been using our technology to create digital twins of their processing plants.
Right, with that, I'm going to hand over to Willem. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start out with just explaining what a digital twin is, just giving a few definitions of what they actually are. We use them mostly just to quantify the effect of different decisions. And then there's various levels of digital twins, which we'll get into. So um, just first off the definition here, um, this definition, um, it's a bit lengthy, but in essence, what it comes down to, it's a digital replica of anything. It could be a, a component, a product, a whole system. We typically look more at a system level, and then it could be in any kind of discipline. It could just be purely electronical, there's different simulation domains in which these digital twins can be constructed. Then obviously your scope um, can end and start anywhere. Uh, then obviously there's another component to that where there's different domains in terms of, how do I put it? You could do focus on an industrial application or you could focus on a metallurgical application. You could focus on it, the whole life cycle of an operation or just as is now. There's a lot of different digital twins out there. So what we're going to be focusing on is process digital twins. Um, the term is a bit confusing because we're now talking about processing plants, but it actually refers to looking at the whole system and not looking on one component, but seeing how this value chain integrates um in totality so the rise of all of these terms have been very quite popular so the green line you see there is actually the rise of uh, the search term for ir and the blue line is the search term digital twin so we can see there from about 2017 onward the digital twin has been rising and from about 2015 the word for ir has come to bear then if we look at studies, this is also increasing. Every year, the amount of studies on digital twins are doubling, which means this is definitely a rising trend and something that's going to be uh, prevalent in the future. The digital twin maturity model is something I think is really describes well what digital twins are and throughout operations, how it goes from being very immature where you just report on what your actual operations are doing. And then you've got some things like analyzing what you have done. So that Power BI would typically come in here. Then where we start to come in is more in the space of predicting, integrating and prescribing. So uh, a lot of the academics say that a digital twin is not really a digital twin until it's integrated with live data. And I tend to agree with that. Um, Otherwise, you typically just have what we're used to as a simulation model. You have to actually link it to live data for it to be a digital twin. Um, so what we do mostly at this stage, most of our clients are still between this predicting and integrating stage and not really at the prescribing and autonomous decision making yet. Um, we'll see at lower levels, it's easier to make autonomous decisions. But at the level of a process digital twin, where you're looking at the entire system, it's much more strategic decision making. It's, it's far harder. And you also have different data sources. And these data sources aren't only just in one format. Uh, we'll speak to that um, in a bit more detail just now. So uh, the, there's different simulation domains. So different simulation domains that you could use to actually model your and create your digital twin so typically um, you get big uh, broad um, classifications so that would be you get stochastic and deterministic so deterministic there's no variation in it and then you get static and dynamic and then you get continuous and discrete so static would be um, not through time dynamic would be a simulation through time Continuous is then obviously something more continuous in flow. So processing plants are typically more continuous. Um, and then discrete is something more like your mining operations where you've got discrete truckloads going through. In our mind, you can't really uh, simulate a 
or create their digital twin um, if you don't go stochastic dynamic and then actually what we do is integrate both um, continuous and discrete otherwise you can't really replicate uh, a real life system and so it's a lot of terminology and and all of that but what it comes down to is decision support you want to gather enough information to accurately make uh, decisions about your operation. So it comes down to risk mitigation, um, identifying your bottlenecks, cost improvements, capital avoidance. So mostly we see high returns in capital avoidance. And then what we're moving towards is simulation as a service, a continuous um, supporting of a client throughout. And that's where digital twins are moving towards. So you can quickly make those uh, run those scenarios that come up in the boardroom. Um, can we do this? Can we do that? Uh, the thing is with a digital twin, you've got your real system mapped out. You make a change and directly you can inform that decision. So that directly might be within two days, but still we're moving into a faster and faster environment. So you could make that decision in an hour, uh, potentially in future. I feel that's still a great advancement from a feasibility study where you take a couple of months just months just to realize it's not going to work. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Yaku now just to explain why we need um, stochastic models and uh, dynamic models really to replicate the system and where specifically in processing plants it becomes difficult to do it in a just a mathematical um, way. Thank you, Willem. Yeah, the um, conundrum we have here is, is really around system dynamics and um, too often that has been ignored by engineers that design processing plants or even um, brownfields projects where certain improvement projects are considered without really considering the effect of system dynamics. Um, so what we're looking at here is really just a rudimentary uh, schematic that I, I compiled just to illustrate the concept of system dynamics. So so really, um, if, if we look at this, this um, example, um, the first thing we have to um, take, take note of is the material that we mine, say this is a mine obviously, um, is highly variable. What I mean by that, the particle size distribution or PSD is highly variable. In other words, we have very fine material up to very coarse material. And um, obviously the purpose of a crushing and screening plant is really to size the material to the correct size to put it through the mill. Um, so theoretically, every hour, minute or second, the material can vary. Um, and I say theoretically because really simulation model is just a theoretical model, but it's quite an accurate model as it relates to particle size distribution. So just consider this example. If we have material that's been fed from the stockpile onto a screen, uh, that's flow A, it then flows over the screen, it goes, the oversize goes into the secondary crusher from where it's screened again to flow D flowing into a bin and the undersized flow B go straight down to CV01, which is a conveyor belt, okay? So conceivably what, what can happen here is if we're in a period where um, in our distribution, we've got very coarse material, um, the, the material going into the tertiary, to the secondary crusher can be more than the crusher's design. In other words, we have to throttle back the feed, which makes, what, what makes matters even worse is if the material is coarse, the the overflow from the tertiary crushes. So that is, if you look at the schematic F and H, that flow increases as well, which in turn will fill up that bin, which has a further detrimental effect on a secondary crusher capacity. So you can see it's sort of a double whammy uh, what happens if you get into coarse material and this. Um, normally, process engineers work on averages of splits, um, splits, average oversized percentage, and it's just a mass balance. 
But as you can see here, if, if this sort of thing happens, we're going to lose capacity and it's, it's almost impossible to make up that capacity. Yes, you can say if we have fine material, uh, the load on the crushing circuit will decrease. In other words, say flow B is a lot higher, but then again, we are limited by the capacity of the conveyor belt. So, um, so, so really, this is just a simple example of how process variation can degrade capacity. And I think lastly, what I want to state is that simulation really is the only tool that can capture the complexity of this variation, as well as the system approach in terms of the, the, the other thing I haven't even mentioned is just the system availability of the random breakdowns of every single component in the system. And, um, you know, typically something like this, we can use the, the simulation to determine what should that bin size be in order to absorb all the variation in a process. So I'm sure I'll get some questions later on on this, so, um, but I think we can move on. Thank you. All right, so in this simple example, uh, if we play this video, this is just re um, really uh, adding on to what I just said. Um, it's some of you that already know, some of you will recognize these small models. Um, the one on top left is, is really we've got a source which could be the stockpile, for instance, and uh, two servers or processes it could be a crusher, it could be screen or anything else, but it's a series system. So a lot of times people would say, OK, I want a thousand tons per hour through the system. In other words, I size every single component for a thousand tons. Um, and if there's no variation in the system, in other words, no variation in flow rates because of this uh, particle size distribution or other properties of the material, um, then quite easily we can get a thousand tons. OK, um, there's no breakdowns of equipment, etc. Um, if we move over to the right, you can see there we're running a live simulation there. So what we did now is we've varying the thousand tons plus minus 20 percent. Um, and as you can see, because we've got no buffer between the two servers, we're only averaging around 960 tons per hour. If we start um, putting variation in the plants as well, in other words, um, equipment doesn't perform always perform uh, at the same level, that degrades even further. It goes down to about 944 tons per hour. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, what we see a lot is the surge capacity in these processing plants is, is inadequate. If we then just add a small bin between those two processes, we can already see the throughput throughput increasing. So just a small schematic to to illustrate the uh, differences and or the effect of variation in, on processes. Um, all right, this is pretty much um, the same one. Willem, maybe you want to talk about this one? Yep. Uh, so what we see a lot as well is that clients, you struggle to quantify the return flow. And also what happens is with this coarser PSD that comes through, you now get more return flow and you have to compensate for that. And that also degrades performance um, over time and then you don't meet your nameplate. And so we've got a specific case study really to illustrate this, uh, we, we had a client which obviously wants to remain an, uh, anonymous in this case, but they designed the plant, everything was signed off, and at the end they needed to just get the simulation done as well, and so they approached us. Uh, we simulated the plant and then confirmed that they would actually only reach 65% of their total capacity um, that they planned for and designed for. And so we could tell them beforehand it's not going to work and we could mitigate that risk um, and a bunch of red faces there. And that's really like the risk of not doing a simulation is you can put all this capital down and it just doesn't work. Um, so a couple of uh, things that help them out a lot is they, they designed the process with a lot of return flows and they didn't have buffers in their system. So 
once one component went down, this whole plant went down. So the availability of the system was very low. And then the return flows that didn't adequately compensate in terms of capacity for those return flows. So that's a mini case study before uh, we move on. So how we see digital twins uh, looking and uh, working as we, we spoke of, Valhalla spoke of this uh, just a bit earlier as well. So you've got your real system, your processing plant, then you've got some data capturing, then you've got some data storage. Uh, in the end, you visualize that. But simulation for us sits at the pinnacle of what you do with your data at the end. It is all about decision support and informed decision making. So there's a couple of examples of tools that you could be using. So Simeo is obviously the one we're using, but any logic flexim could also work. Um, then visualization, we use Power BI, but Tableau, ClickView, similar products. Um, so how we see this working practically um, is on a feedback loop. So you have your operation, the sensors get your data, we plug that data into the digital twin. That digital twin then informs you on the decisions you need to make in order to change your operation. You make those changes and then you keep on improving the cycle, making sure your sensors are correct, making sure the data you actually have in your databases are correct, improving the information you actually collect and making sure that you're collecting the correct information. Um, so there's two links from the digital twin to the data visualization and one from the data storage to the data visualization. The reason for that is you could feasibly write from your digital twin back into your data storage. Um, typically, we don't do this because you get a lot of junk. Um, there's a lot of scenario analysis and things like that that you do offline, so you don't necessarily want to store, store all of that information. So we typically go direct from uh, Simeo into Power BI. Then in terms of the next uh, focus on what we're going to be talking about, obviously we spoke about how this could be applied to any industry. Um, and then it can be applied on a complete value chain. So that's from bench prep until you reach your um, final product delivered in the port. Uh, we do also do those type of studies. In this case, we're going to just talk about the processing plant in isolation. These processing plants can then later be linked back up into a complete value chain model. Um, so this project we did a couple of years back and I've still one of our greatest successes and a great client of ours uh, was done on a processing plant um, that processes, uh, it's actually a concentrate the processing uh, platinum. So the questions that uh, were, the problem that was stated is there's basically there's a lot of different scenarios that they want to analyze. How much throughput would they get for each of these uh, scenarios? How could they further increase their throughput, make their plant more sufficient, get more bang for their buck? Um, so it's really, if you look at it, it's a whole mess of things. You've got different data sources. There's unplanned downtime, there's planned downtimes, and then there's initiatives and people saying we should do this and that. And you can find yourself in a situation where you just don't, you can't answer it. And so that's really where simulation comes in, giving you a confidence in achieving your targets, um, giving you a platform to play with um, what else you can do. So the typical process. Um, actually includes documentation, but then the digital world, your digital twin would be your documentation, but you go from inputs to model to outputs, and then you refine your um, inputs as you go forward. But it's a continuous process. So typically in the past, we found you do one study. Uh, so you do a feasibility study, and then the role of the simulation model ends. And the digital twin era says no this should continue it should be linked to your systems it should continuously improve as your operations improve and so in continuously inform your decisions and continuously uh, drive value in your operation now we've spoken a lot about things but how does this practically look what goes in what comes out and how does simio actually look um so 
this picture was actually provided to us by one of our clients to explain our own work, but I found it to be very informative. So the this just simplifies so much what we do. And so on the input side of things, we put into the model um, things like the treatment schedules, your maintenance schedules, your operating and control philosophies, things like if this bin fills up, you should be throttling down um, feed rate. Then equipment reliability and maintainability, this deteriorates performance of processing plants quite a lot. Equipment capacity, that's a very easy statement to make, but determining the actual capacity of components in a processing plant is a lot of effort. Um, and then stockpile capacity and processing plant uh, <laughs> silo capacity. So these buffers and the effect of these buffers get input put into the model. Then um, sometimes we do go into the particle size distributions, depends on the client and the application. We put in grade and then so depending on the commodity we're using, there's different applications in this case it was platinum so there's not a lot of variance in the material in terms of different material types uh, but what you found in what we found in the diamond industry is they've got different material types which have significantly different uh, characteristics which influence uh, plant performance quite a lot um, from that that all feeds into uh, the model so some of this can be linked um, We'll talk a bit more about this just after this. Um, that all feeds into this model. Uh, the model runs through time, as we spoke about it being dynamic. We put in the throughputs for each component. Then the variation plays out over time. And what you get in the end is the availability of your plant and each component, utilization of each component. So this can be done on brown fields or uh, green fields. If it's green fields, we typically calibrate to these parameters as well. Your direct operating hours for the plant and for the process as a whole, throughput rates, throughput bottlenecks, I'll show you a demo of that just now. Um, and then your stockpile levels and surge bin levels over time. Then depending on the application, we'll build in things like your ounces delivered and recovery. Uh, if diamonds, you'd obviously uh, get to carrots delivered. And then for some clients, we've also included financial uh, indicators. Again, depends on what you need and where you want to go with your digital twin. So the things we found, uh, actually just going back, uh, I've skipped over this uh, slightly. So to make this a true digital twin, you actually have to link this. So you have to get live reliability and maintainability information from your systems. You have to get live uh, planned maintenance from your systems. So what we find typically is that these things just lie around in Excel sheets instead of being uh, well documented in the SAP system. The latest version is somehow always in an Excel sheet and that's not really uh, not a true digital twin if it comes down to it. You need to have a live system always updated, always up to date to really feed your digital twin and to make your digital twin reliable. And as I spoke of the equipment capacities, people are very uncertain. The, the design capacities are almost never the actual capacity of a component. And so what those actual capacities are and having that all stored in a neat and organized manner is would be great. Then the other thing we find as well is you've got online PSD cameras and things like that, but these PSDs don't actually accurately reflect the operations PSD. So there's a lot of data source uh, type problems that operations have to overcome to really start building true digital twins um, and then this really helped me also to get a get a grip of what what is important in terms of data and so uh, it's, it's a lot of the time we find the validity of the data provided is an issue and so these type of things take up more time than the actual modeling side of things is getting the correct information getting to the um, 
precise information of an operation. You get also a lot of different types of data, a variety of tables and Excel sheets and SQL databases and historians, and you have to combine all of these to really get to a process digital twin. And so the output of this um, looks to is in Power BI, and so for each different operation, we then construct a custom dashboard for their specific uh, KPIs. Now, this just helps the client. So in terms of calibration, this is a very useful tool, seeing whether the, the model actually matches um, your operation. And then from there on running the scenarios. So some things like uh, just came out here is just the recovery, mass pool, things like that. Uh, we put in the mathematical models and considering the stochastic nature of this, what that would end up in terms of a annual figure. If we then drill down into these, we can then go and look at each hour. So what we've also found very useful is our bottleneck identifier. So this just gets us to quickly and easily identifying the bottleneck in terms of throughput and time. So which component is most stressed most of the time and then operating most of the time. So that component is the component keeping back your total process. And we've proved this time and time again where you can just up that component's capacity and we can quantify the effect in terms of throughput. The reason why this is important, so a lot of the time you'd focus initiatives on components and processes that really aren't the bottleneck of your system. So you'd expect to see a return in terms of throughput, but in the end you just don't realize the expected throughput gain because you didn't focus the effort on the bottleneck. And so if you focus your effort, so it's a theory of constraints type approach we use, but if you focus your um, effort on your bottleneck, you'll actually see that return in terms of an annual throughput number. So getting back to the case study really is they had a couple of different op um, options to review. Uh, we constructed all of these options, um, working closely aligned with the client. Obviously, the clients always uh, know their uh, plants better, and that's very true. And so then from there, we could help them make an informed decision on what's it going to cost and uh, how much throughput would they gain. Uh, in the end, it came down to the following. Uh, they will, were able to save a significant uh, capital investment, sacrificing throughput by 8%. But also uh, reducing their operating costs. Um, and what's nice about this uh, specific case is at the end, we could go back and see that we're actually achieving the throughputs and the operations that the model said they would. And uh, well, that's just a lot of satisfaction. Um, so it's not just looking at the output, it's quantifying the effect of different decisions to make sure that. You make the correct decisions and avoid spending undue capital. I hope this provided some background into digital twins and uh, where the industry is at and where we're moving. Uh, Yaku, I'll hand back over to you. Yeah, sorry, just a bit of sales talk now after all this. Um, so what's in it for everyone on, on, on this call? I think what we want to emphasize is um, ACT is really prepared to um, work with international partners, um, um, obviously people like in Canada, Australia and so forth, um, uh, different clients that we have and we, we like to collaborate, um, sharing our technology, um, potentially training people um, in, in order to use that uh, and, and to enable them to maybe slightly um, alter their, their service offering to, to provide more advanced solutions. Um, we also um, obviously selling the Simia software, a premier partner, have been for um, the last 12 years here in Southern Africa, but um, we do sales all over the world. And um, something we're really working on is um, with Simio as well is to uh, make advances in what we call our processing plant library which contains some custom objects that really just uh, enables you to build these models a lot quicker and actually 
get a lot of the logic sort of pre-programmed. So if you want to talk to us um, offline, we're more than happy to talk to you about that process in plan library. Um, as Phil Adam said, we've got a bunch of experienced consultants. So if, if you purely have a project that you want to talk to us about, um, you're more than welcome. Um, yeah, that's that's just just briefly on a, on a bit of sales talk. Thanks. OK, Thanks I've seen these. Uh, uh, sorry, Mark, there's been quite a few questions. Um, I've tried to answer some of them. Um, let's just have a quick look, maybe Marco, before you start. Let, let's see if we, we answered and maybe um, give opportunity for more questions. Yeah, so Jaco, I was just thinking of um, directing, directing some of these um, questions um, towards you. So um, one of them was um, Lewis or Louis, where he mentioned how much maintenance can be expected on a digital twin um, besides updating the input data set. It's, so you yeah, mentioned answer, uh, not uh, much at all. Could you expand a bit on that? Yeah, I think if you look at these projects, um, the bulk of the work really is around building, setting up the model. Um, and it's it's really around digitizing process flow diagrams. Um, but I think more and more these days, uh, the data has become almost as much work as, as the model itself. And, and really to calibrate these models to reflect reality, not only on average numbers, but also on distribution, say of head feed, uh, feed of a plant. Uh, and uh, the fault finding, if you do not calibrate the model, where is all the problems? Is the problem in the data or is it in your model? So, um, but as soon as we have that, um, uh, we, we, we found that um, really it's, it's and we solve the data problems, then it's not a lot of work at all. At all. Interesting. Yeah. All right, no, thank you. The, and then, um, yeah. So it just Willem. depends on the actual operation and then also um, depends on the stakeholders we have um, on the ground. So if you allocate the resource to this, um, that would, I will, would be what I prescribe, then uh, SET is not all that important anymore. So um, we, we basically hand it over to the operation. Um, Villain, another question here is um, from Sam saying, can an entire um, mine say be simulated? Is there anything that you can't really get to where you say this is almost like this is impossible or is it pretty much as much as possible? Uh, most things are possible. Yeah, we've done total mines um, up until uh, train dispatch at this point. So from bench prep drilling um, straight through your truck and shoveling operations, so mostly on open cost, strangely, um, and then um, processing plant up until your train dispatch. Um, we've done some similar type of thing um, at the Mundel build. We've, we've gone from the stoping model straight through um, to the processing plants and concentrate dispatched. And also put to port really, so port operations as well. So it's, yep. it's, it's the whole value chain. Great, awesome. And then um, um, you, you mentioned uh, briefly in the beginning, but the difference between a simulation model and a digital twin. So they are really closely related, but uh, Yaku, you were mentioning that, um, that a digital twin uh, contains the process constraints but then as soon as the model is connected to real data, it becomes a true digital twin. So, um, Yaku, do you, yeah, um, do you want to expand on that? Or? I'm going to give that question to Willem. <laughs> yeah, so there's a couple of uh, literature studies and uh, some, well, I'd say about 70% of them, which is now very arbitrary, but some then uh, say a model cannot be uh, or at least a digital twin must be a simulation model of some kind. Um, so the, the debate in what, what I've read up to now is, is still open, uh, but most do say it needs to be a simulation model. It needs to be directly linked to data. Um, I'd say for yeah. some application model, so for some applications of digital twins, it's different though. So if you're looking at a maintenance digital twin in terms of when is this bearing going to fail, that's not necessarily a uh, simulation model. But if you're looking on a process um, type scale, then really it needs to be a uh, simulation model. 
All right, great. So we've had some new questions coming in here. Um, so uh, someone asked what training is offered by SET? So we do customize training. Uh, typically, we have the standard Simeo training course just to get you aligned with the basics of Simeo. But if we then construct a simulation model for a client, we then offer a customized training on that specific model and the logic of that model. Awesome, great. And then um, someone typically, else asked was yes. Just sorry, Mocha. Um, it's typically around two to three days for that training. Just wanted to. Yeah. We had someone about Timeline. two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. And okay. um, someone else asked, was the case study model linked to live data? Uh, unfortunately, not. Um, we're moving more towards that, but at that stage is quite a while back. Um, Lewis or Lee asked again, is there a fundamental difference in the approach to creating a digital twin versus creating a conventional model to answer any specific process related questions? So the, the main difference would be in how you set up your data. So um, and then setting up the model to be able to handle the data. All right, interesting. Yeah, and then um, someone else uh, for, oh sorry, Warren actually asked uh, once a digital twin is in operation, can the production team or operators run their own scenarios for day to day ideas? Yep, that is uh, completely the point of this. Um, and that's where we want our clients to be and where we've got some of our clients to be. Yeah, just on that one, maybe it's not always so straightforward. I, I would say the, um, on the other end, if the operational rules change, then there's a bit of programming involved. But if we know up front, um you know which levers they want to pull and and play with we can then set up the model that that the operators can run our own simulations yep so sometimes the ideas are just a bit more out of the ordinary where there's actually a complete change to the processing plant and those type of things uh, you just can't accommodate in terms of building the digital twin and that's where we come into play with the support and maintenance on the digital twins all right, perfect. And then uh, lastly, someone else uh, asked what simulation could one typically run? Thermo hydraulic simulations or process flow? So, Yaku, you mentioned that um, thermo or thermo hydraulic simulators are fundamentally different. So, I think a lot of time with simulations, they can get a bit um, confused between the two. Hey. Uh, right, right. So I I've, I've did answer it there. Um, there's a yeah. fundamental difference. Um, as I said, the thermo um, simulators really, it's it's chemical engineering simulators is, is different uh, in concept to Simeo. So it's, um, they normally involve mass, momentum, energy, temperature, things like that. So it's not to say those simulators are not important, but I think what we advocate in, in this webinar is, um, you know, understanding the constraints of the system. So an engineer may use other tools um, that are better suited to Simeo for certain type of simulations. Let's just look at an energy balance of uh, a smelter, for instance. Um, that could be a completely different type of model. But um, in terms of fundamentally a logistical type and capacity simulator is, is, is the main difference that we use Simia for. All right, perfect. And then um, la 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 last question I see here is um, how do we actually link Simia to live data? Willem, I see you typing away there. Yeah, I wanted to type, but it's easier to hmm. answer. Um, <laughs> So now Simeo can link to most SQL databases. Um, so it can directly link to uh, CSV files, Excel files. Uh, typically, that's not where we want to be in terms of building a digital twin. You actually want to link to the ERPs and the SQL databases directly. Uh, but it's simple. You, you just link the table to a database. It's the simplest of right. answers. Perfect. Um, I think that pretty much rounds up all of our questions. If anyone else has any other questions, you're welcome to go to our website or send either Willem or any one of our consultants an email and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I'm going to be heading off to Wilhelm now. Um, from everyone us, from everyone at SET though, I'd like to say thank you very much for accommodating us. You've been great and yeah, we hope to see you again soon.
Thank you, Willem. Well, hello, and everyone. Thanks, Marco. Wow, that was amazing. When last have you seen an engineer smile so much when he talks about his technology? Like you can really <laughs> see that Willem and, <laughs> and Yaku really enjoys what they're doing. You know, the guys are really doing great things. I think I'm honored to work with a team like this because in previous lives, we often talk, ah, oh, we're going to do a digital twin, we're going to do simulations. But, you know, you can see here the guys are physically doing it daily. 26 industrial engineers in our Foresight OT team doing it, you know. So we're a team of 80 people and this is this is the simulation team. And, and they're out there and they're doing these process warehouse rail simulations daily. And they're working in South America, they're working in America, in North America, projects in Australia, lots of mining projects as well and bringing value. I've been in, in meetings with them where, you know, they go and they tell, you know, mine management or operational management, listen, you can actually save X hundred million um, on a large scale, and and I go like, but you cannot say that, and and but but yeah, you know, when you do a a proper simulation and when you run these constraint theories, then you can say that, and like you know, it's amazing the value that we bring um to the clients, and and so so thank you, Yaku, thank you, Willem, thank you, Marco, for the good preparation for the well delivery, and it was well done, guys. So so quite amazing. Then, you know, so, so this event has been recorded, so you can refer back to it. You'll get an email tomorrow morning. You can share it with, with some of your colleagues. Introduce the concept of digital twin simulation to them. You know, debate further. Um, you heard Yaku and also Willem speak about contact us. Contact us, uh, them. You know, the, the consultants are ready to engage with you to discuss in more detail how we approach a project. You know, and, and how do you do it in sort of agile sprints and, and waves and you know, quite quickly to do that. So, you know, and it just forms part of this whole 11 week, um, you know, webinar series, educational webinar series. We believe nowadays, and specifically in this VUCA period, you have to educate yourself. You have to prepare yourself, you know, better for tomorrow. And so we've gone on this educational webinar series. We really try to take certain topics or themes associated with um, 4IR, you know, digital transformation and, and all things that we at Foresight OT don't just talk about, we physically implement it every time. We have specialist teams that work with these things and that's the activity and that's what they focus on. So refer back to those recordings, um, uh, the links are there available, we make it available. And this date, you know, so this 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 uh, 22nd of October, you know, I, I'll say a little bit more about that, but you know, we, what we'll do is, is we'll get everybody in a room together. Let me go there right now, you know, um, um, uh, you know and, and, and show you a little bit more about that. So, so really the concept is, is we will be, you know, call it hanging or, or, or uh, interacting with you for about a, from nine o'clock in the morning till about four o'clock in the afternoon. And you'll have a whole host of option of what you can do, you know, so, so we'll have plenary sessions and we'll have, you know, sort of um, CEOs and CEOs of, of our vendors coming in internationally from America, you know, and from other parts of the world talking, you know, and presenting plenary sessions on, you know, what's happening and, you know, in the new norm and how are they adopting and how they're using technology and how we're using, you know, deep learning and these latest simulation technologies to bring value. And we'll also have, you know, plenary breakout sessions where you can deep dive in, for example, a warehouse simulation or a, or you know, or or a specific you know a topic on or, you know how does uh, uh, um, opti slot look or whatever you can go or you can go for example to the stand. So if if you cannot find anything interesting in this specific place related to IT systems or business environment, you can go to a stand and interact with the system in, uh, simulation engineering technology team at the stand and sort of guys how would we approach this you know a lot of the questions that you're doing that you ask right now you could ask face to face to the guys and they'll be there in this virtual space chatting to you so really try and get this event um, in your calendar as well uh, you'll get the links for that very very soon then with no further ado what i'm going to do is i'm going to um, sort of sign off and thank you all for being here today and, and taking the time. You know, this I know it's the hour of your valuable time, but it's a very interesting topic and you can really bring a lot of value to your operations, to your you know facilities if you start thinking about this. And it's it's sort of sitting at the heart of this digital transformation that we're doing for clients and we're doing it daily. So please um, interact with us. You know, let us know you know what your views are and hope to see you soon at one of our other events. Thank you.